to neutron star mergers as the primary side, both from the nuclear physics perspective, but also from chemical evolution arguments. And I'll show how actually some of the arguments that have been made to roll out neutron star mergers in the past have actually been incorrect. So I'll talk about how is the R process produced in each of these. Where, that means basically the sites in which these elements are actually injected into our own galaxy, and when, meaning in time. Uh, of course, since I'm uh, a little biased, I'll talk a little bit more in detail about how we actually make the R process in these mergers. Uh, and you can see my biases here. But hopefully at the end I will convince you that actually clues from chemical evolution rather point out to mergers as the primary site, uh, mainly in looking at the RMS abundance fluctuations of uh, the europium content in, in old stars. Okay, so the majority, if not all of the information that we have gained about heavy element production has come from highest resolution spectroscopic observations of the sun. Here we don't only have our fossil record of chemical evolution, uh, but we also have a lot of nuclear physics information. Yeah, so this is an amazing laboratory to study nuclear physics, and of course, as you know, going from that spectrum to this abundance pattern has taken quite a bit of work, but now this is rather solid. So the first thing I want you to notice is to focus your attention into the, in this axis, and you can clearly see that odd elements are rare. That's the first thing that jump into, uh, into by looking at this graph. You also see that the element abundance peaks are correlated with these neutron closed shells and proton closed shells. Yeah? Since neutron closed shells and proton closed shells are independent of each other, these are called the so-called magic numbers. Yeah? An element can be, or a nuclei can be actually doubly magical, like lead, for example. Uh, and you can clearly see that the abundance pattern peaks relate <coughs> to where these magic numbers are. Yeah? And there are some interesting issues here, which will, I, I will explain why, particularly, these two, these two peaks are actually displayed in this plane. In addition, you also see, of course, that the normalization tells you how these elements were actually synthesized in the universe, with a big bang basically contributed with the majority of the baryonic mass in the first two minutes in the evolution of the universe. And then you clearly see the alpha capture uh, processes inside stars, you clearly see that iron, which is the most bound nuclei in the cosmos, and it's also produced by multiple mechanisms, has a very strong abundance peak. As you all know, iron is the most highly bound nuclei, and of course, all reactions leading to it are basically exothermic in nature which means that are basically giving you energy to the system. And beyond iron, you actually have to give energy. And these reactions are basically endothermic. There are really two impediments in making elements heavier than iron. One, of course, as I was saying, you know, iron is the most bound nuclei. As you proceed in this fusion chain, you basically get energy back from the system, as we know that fusion is what keeps stars alive. But once you get to iron, basically you have to give energy to the system in order to actually be able to make this element. So that's the first impediment. The second impediment, which is actually more restrictive, is basically the increase of the Coulomb barrier uh, as a function of C number. What does that mean? Well, it means that in fact for standard typical stellar temperatures, these charged reactions are actually forbidden because the Coulomb barrier is drastically increasing. And as a result, the majority of elements uh, heavier than iron have to be actually catalyzed by neutron capture. Yeah. And in fact, how does this proceed? Uh, we have two ways of doing it. One is called the S process. One is called the R process. S stands for slow. R stands for rapid. Slow with respect to what? Well, every time you capture a neutron, you basically produce a radioactive uh, isotope, which basically beta decays. And if the time scale between captures is faster than the beta decay time scale, 
we do that it's rapid. While if the capture is slow compared to the beta decay time, we call that slow. Yeah? And hopefully, in the past few slides, I will try to explain to you how these abundance patterns actually arise and why do we see the shift in, in the abundance peak between the S process and the R process. OK, so I'm going to spend a significant amount of time in showing this plot. This is from a review from Chris Neaton. Uh, here I show proton number versus neutron number. The first thing I want to highlight here is this black nuclei, which are the stable nuclei. This is the beta stability valley. Yeah, and these elements are rather or are, are stable. And in fact, the S process proceeds very close to a stability. What happens? Well, you get a neutron capture, and you beta decay. In this case, basically, you can take a significant amount of time to get your second capture and so on. So the S process basically leads here very close to the valley or in, in the valley of stability. Something that I want to highlight is while the neutron capture, of course, depends on the flux of neutrons, which depends on your neutron density, your beta, beta decay time depends, of course, on your structure. And if you're very close to the stability and you move away from the stability, the beta decay lifetime becomes progressively shorter. Yeah? So as you are farther and farther away from the stability, these are very short-lived uh, isotopes. What does that mean? Well, that means that the, as you can see here, uh, that the limits of experimental data, which are basically highlighted by this black line, are illustrated here. And one has to actually rely on models <coughs> to explain uh, the properties of these nuclei, which are really, really far from stability. So here I show sort of the maximum abundance of isotopes in a given chain, chain which is basically characteristic of the R process path, which depends on the initial density temperature and electron number, which is basically the neutron to proton ratio. Uh, this is a particular pathway for a separation energy between two to three MeVs. And what you clearly see is that the R process pathway proceeds very, very far away from stability, which is what you expect. And that means that, as you can see here, in a fraction of a second, less than a fraction of a second, you basically have to go all the way uh, to what we call the third peak. So what are these uh, lines illustrating here, which are you know, very, very crucial? These are the closed proton and neutron shells in the so called magic numbers, which are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. Yeah? And you can clearly see them here and highlight it here. So what happens in these magic numbers? So these magic numbers are, in fact, extremely important. And to illustrate their importance, I took uh, the liberty to uh, take one of the standard textbooks and show the neutron capture cross-section of nuclei in the, as in the S process path uh, with a neutron energy of about 25 keV. The first thing that you notice here are the cross-sections is that odd mass numbers tend to have higher cross-sections than even nuclei, which immediately explains the odd even asymmetries that you're seeing in the abundance pattern. And then you can see the substantial lowering on the neutron capture cross-sections in these magic numbers. So what happens there? Well, you expect actually abundances to anti-correlate with where you find <coughs> these unability of these nuclei, which are, in fact, the most stable nuclei, cannot capture neutrons. Okay? So the way to understand how these pathways actually produce, imagine that you have a neutron flux. You can think of these magic numbers as the stagnation, stagnation points from the flow. Basically, you cannot capture neutrons. Yeah? The flow stagnates there. It takes a certain amount of time to actually go through, stagnates again, goes through, stagnates again, and then very rapidly beta decays after basically the chain is completed. So what you see here, which is actually uh, quite nice, is what, this is the R process abundance pattern. And as you can see, the abundance peaks are reflective of where these magic numbers were basically uh, arrived to very, very far from a stability. And then what you're seeing is the projection of this into the mass number plane. So it immediately tells you that if you're in the S process, you reach these magic numbers at a higher mass number. 
Yeah. Why? Because you're very, very close to stability. Well, here you're far away from stability, and then you beta decay, so you have that projection effect. So the first thing, the conclusion from this is that you have the S process peaks, which basically reach these magic numbers very close to stability, and you have the R process peaks, which are basically shifted. Yeah? So naively, in that abundance pattern of the sun that you saw, you clearly see the R process abundance peaks basically shifted to the left. So here you're basically just capturing neutrons, no, no, and then you beta decay. Here, you're basically, uh, you're, I'm sorry? Not, not going along. You're not going along the line. Yeah, yeah, so you, you basically reach here, you basically stagnate, you get tons and tons of basically an element here, you very quickly decay in these, you know, isotope until you basically start capturing neutrons again, no? It's just a stagnation point on the plane. No? So you're going back and forth, back and forth. If I show you a plot, you oh, do this, so it's like and, and you go a zigzag upwards okay. in that detailed direction. Yeah. It is a little confusing. Yeah, when, when you show the zoom in version, you just see the, the zigzag. It's faster, yeah, and I'll show you basically the time scales and in fact a little bit more detail when we do these tracks, I'll show you basically how we proceed on this plane. You tune the time scale so that you can actually go through every single magic number and have enough time to make it through the next peak. Yeah, so what I'm gonna actually in fact show you is that in the case of the type two, we usually get the first peak, but it's really hard to get the second and third peak just because the decompression is relatively fast. Now, I'll, I'll explain the nuclear physics arguments of how to get there. Yeah, you just... They don't care what, what they are because essentially they're set of them. So, so they are processed. That's right. So if you're very, very far from a stability, you get a stagnation at a particular case in which you start basically the abundance of that particular isotope are going up and then basically as soon as you beta decay what you're seeing is the projection of basically the abundance peak at that particular in the in the, the <laughs> that's absolutely right yeah. yeah because you know you basically move yeah the 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 mass the uh, the total number is considered as you go In, in some of the PP and PN process, but they're not the predominant. So I think you know half of the heavy elements above iron are mainly S process and half are mainly R process. But yeah, there are some intermediate elements, particularly uh, before the, you know, right after iron and the first peak that you need proton capture. Okay, so something that it's nice to notice, just as an order of magnitude, for a small neutron velocity, the neutron capture cross-sections are actually inversely proportional to the velocity. So that means that if you want to calculate uh, just the capture rate, uh, these basically only depend on the total density of the neutrons, which is nice. Uh, and that allows you to give you an order of magnitude estimate when you say, well, the S process time scale are around tens of thousands of years while the R process time scales are the order of microseconds, as I was showing you, and therefore for this you need basically low neutron densities, but for these you need significantly high neutron densities to be able to make the, the R process. So you need very high neutron densities, and of course the small time scales which points to an explosive, uh, very high density phenomena. And I won't talk too much about the S process, but it is understood that in the S process the neutron flux can come from carbon and oxygen burning, and even uh, in reactions during helium burning here, the amount of neutrons flux that you're given to the system is basically high enough to produce the uh, S process. So S process happens actually in evolved stars, and in fact, there's been discussions that basically we don't understand the astrophysical side for at least half of the elements above us. Another thing that I forgot to highlight, uh, I'll go back to, 
to this plot is that when, when you talk about a particular element, it's not necessarily made by the S process or by the R process. It can be made by two, you know, by both of them, as you can see here. But for example, europium, which is in this rare Earth peak, is actually the one that we measure in stars because the oscillation strength is actually very high. We see these very deep absorption features. This is our R process element. Uh, of course, my favorite peak here, which is platinum and gold, that's also purely R process. Yeah? So one has to be careful sometimes when you see, say, for example, barium, uh, and you basically want to use as an indicator of S or, S or R process that it could be produced you know, equally, almost equally, for, from both processes. So none of these mechanisms you know, hold exclusiveness in, in a particular element. That's right, and the, the key is what, which ones are the stable ones. No? And when you have you know, a non-stable one, say like uranium, you can actually use, you, know, you can basically do you know, dating using basically the, ratio, the isotopic ratios that you see in stars. OK, so this is you know, the so-called Sneeden star uh, in honor of Chris Sneeden. And you know, if you look at this star, it looks boring, uh, not very interesting. But in fact, when you actually look uh, at its you know, European composition, uh, the first thing that you notice is this is the R process in this on the sun compared to the abundance pattern of this star. And the match is you know, pretty pretty good, it's pretty amazing. Uh, this star has an iron content that is three orders of magnitude less than the sun, yet it has a europium content that it's about a factor of 500 times larger than the sun. Yeah? So of course, the, in normalization, you know, the abundance has actually, it's, it's significantly higher, but the pattern is basically very, very similar to that of the sun. Uh, uh, this is a relative abundance. Uh, I'm sorry. Relative abundance, and let me see what zero is, uh, you know, of this element. Yeah, and then you basically look at differential abundance space. So some people use iron, some people use different anchors. Yeah. So in this case, as you can see, it's this one. Uh, I'm going back and forth. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so the other important thing is that. We basically now have very detailed spectroscopic observations of a wide range of stars with a wide range of metallicities in which we see that the R process is extremely robust yeah? from stars to stars. So the total amount of R process material in a star can drastically vary from one star to the other, but the pattern is very robust. Yeah? I'm coming close to you, Scott, so you don't fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> So basically what this tells you is that a wide range of epochs in the history of the universe, the pattern, you know, it's basically robust. And the mechanism that has to give rise to that pattern, you know, has to also have very robust nuclear physics to get you to the, that pattern. So in these sort of uh, arguments that have been going on for the past 20 years, uh, we basically uh, talk about type 2. Uh, supernova and neutron star mergers. And I don't know what happened to my slides. But uh, here, the number that you have to remember is about 10 to the minus 7 solar masses per year. Uh, that's more or less the rate of production of our process in our own Milky Way. Okay? So whatever mechanism you want to <coughs> invoke, you basically have to produce that rate. And not surprisingly, Type 2, the neutrino-driven wind is basically very common, but produce very small amount of mass, about 10 to the minus 7, one every 100 years, while mergers you know, are significantly rarer, but they produce significantly more our process. And when you multiply those two, you get as an order of magnitude 10 to the minus 7 solar masses per year of our process production. Yeah? And sort of a recurring theme of my talk will be to try to construct, you know, contrast this to different production sites. And I'll explain why it's been that for the past 30 years we haven't been able to effectively synthesize the R processing type 2. And I'll guide you through some of the arguments as to why is it that we in fact need significantly more entropy uh, 
in the region where the neutrinos are basically deposited their energy. And how is it that in the neutron star mergers, the nuclear physics pathways are extremely robust? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go that into detail. So I'm going to talk about how, where, and when. So again, as it was pointed out, you really need a very short dynamical time scale. So the ejection time scale here is about 100 milliseconds, while in the neutron star mergers is about 10 milliseconds. Uh, I'm going to be using here what we call the electron uh, fraction. The electron fraction is given by this expression here. So if you have equal number of neutrons and protons, the electron fraction is 0.5. When the electron fraction is actually very low, that means that you have very neutron-rich material. As you can see here, uh, the, in the supernova case, the electron fraction is not very low. It's between 0.2 and 0.4. So what does that mean? Well, that means that in nuclear statistical equilibrium and those entropies, you basically have free nucleons and protons, yeah? which basically, as soon as you start expanding, they recombine into alpha particles. Yeah? And then alpha particles have the difficult task of giving you the seed nuclei so that neutrons can capture into those seed nuclei. Yeah? So you, you have these neutron-catalyzed triple alpha reactions to get you from this alpha particle to carbon-12. As you know, these are three and four, you know, four body reaction rates, so they're relatively slow. Yeah? So what ends up happening in this decompression is what it's called the alpha free stab. What does that mean? That neutrons are not able to basically catalyze enough seeds fast enough, and you end up with tons and tons of alpha particles. Yeah? And the key to produce the R process is the neutron yeah, to seed ratio. And it's basically understood that if you basically did not use a significant fraction of your alpha particles, then you have lots of neutrons, because all of these are neutron-catalyzed reactions. Yeah? And the problem in this scenario is that in order to have a very large neutron to seed ratio, you need very high entropies. Yeah? So in the classical Woosley 93 paper, the entropies that they used were about 10 to 20, so, you know, 20 MeV, and that are entropies that are about a factor of five larger. Now, in contrast, the material in the neutron star merger is extremely neutron rich. No, no, it's just the R over V, if you want. You know, you know where basically the size of the proton neutron star is and the expansion time, which basically tells you how quickly the material decompresses and the density goes down. Do you get any acceleration that those energies you could knock the back off? Well, you get fissions, and I'll show you in the fission reaction rates, you know, when you know in the neutron capture you also get fission fractures and you get fission fragments yeah but these are very very high densities so what happens well the beauty in the neutron star merger case which gives you really this robustness is that the material is so neutron rich that in nuclear statistical equilibrium which i show you here what you basically have for free is neutrons and lots of seed nuclei to begin with so you basically have the correct neutron flux but you also have the targets ready to do the capture. Yeah, and as you can see here, uh, you have in nuclear statistical equilibrium, nuclear between you know, 50 and 82. And those serve basically as the seed nuclear for the capture of the neutrons to proceed to very, very high uh, atomic numbers. So when, and this is basically where a significant, uh, I, I'd say when, when significant debate as to whether neutron star mergers are eligible as the main mechanism for the R process has relied heavily on when these objects are assembled. So as you know, uh, type 2 only rely on the mainly main sequence lifetime of these massive stars, which is very, very fast. So these objects basically die very close to their birthplace, and they do it relatively quickly. Well, in neutron star mergers, you actually have to assemble them. And even though each of them comes from a supernova whose lifetime is rather short. One of the big problems is that in order to have two neutron stars you know, close enough to merge in less than a Hubble time, one of them has to actually undergo a common envelope evolution in which basically drag can bring the object significantly deeper, leave the helium core, 
and then leave them close enough so they can merge in less than a Hubble time. And if you look at the, and I'll show you that delay times after these are purely then determined by the gravitational wave merging time that they range from anywhere between 100 mega years to 10 giga years. And in some ways, a very, very strong constraint come from the size of the helium structure. Yeah? You cannot get them closer than that. So people have argued that the fact that these take significant amount of delay prevents neutral star mergers to enrich with europium the stars that are low metallicity. And I'll argue against that uh, at the end of my talk. So even though this common envelope seems like magic, uh, we know that it happens. And we know from observations of double pulsars that these objects are basically close enough to merge in less than a Hubble time. Uh, here I just showed you the gravitational merging time scale just to give you an idea. This is period in terms of days. And as you can see here, about 80% of these objects have periods significantly smaller than 80 days. And therefore, they're going to merge in less than a Hubble time. And those 100 uh, mega years to you know, tens of giga years uh, come you know, from the observations of these double neutron stars. And we know that these double neutron stars have gone through a common envelope and have been able to get significantly closer. Yeah. Hmm? How do you know they Well, because if the, if it, because in, in fact, if they were just, you know, if the two binaries that they come from were just basically touching each other, produce the two neutron stars, yeah, the only possible way that you can actually get them to be closer is if the kick is directed towards the other one and you will harden the binary. But that statistically happens in very but few cases. No, and I'll, I'll talk about lunch about some of, the, some of the, I'll talk about common envelope physics. But in fact, there's no other alternative that we know, you know yeah, unless they, they do some thermonuclear magic before they merge, maybe. Uh, OK, so where these systems actually occur, well, Type twos actually happen where the star formation is going on. So they're going to deposit these R process material in the disk. Here, I have borrowed one of uh, Wenfei's uh, um, observations of short GRB. We think that short GRBs come from neutral star mergers. There's many lines of evidence that point in that direction. We, have, uh, we haven't detected gravitational waves. So they're all indirect evidence. But just to give you a feeling, this system's actually merge relatively far away from their host galaxies. Uh, you can see this in this simulation by Luke Kelly, in which he basically injected mass, you know, tracer particle, massless tracer particles in a dark matter simulation with a kick distribution that is basically compatible with the center of mass velocities of these double neutron stars, which are 200 kilometers per second. And these are basically the distribution of merging sites with respect to the galaxy. So the picture that I want you to keep in mind is sort of this one here, in which you know, type 2 happen very often, but produce little you know, to very small quantities of R process material. But they happen very commonly, while R process happen not where the disk. They happen much, uh, you know, they're much less frequent, but they produce significant amount of R process enrichment. And the key is, can you distinguish between these two scenarios? Uh, and I'll argue that in a cosmological framework, you can. So before going through that part of my talk, let, let me just guide you a little bit about uh, how we make the R process in these uh, neutron star mergers. So this is the how. Uh, as you know, once these systems are assembled, uh, they basically start losing energy and angular momentum by emitting gravitational waves. The gravitational waves carry both energy and angular momentum. And the rate of basically period decrease increases as a function of time. They become progressively closer. The amplitude of the waves you know, increase. So the energy and angular momentum losses are progressively uh, larger until they get to a point where they become dynamically unstable and merge. Okay. So this is sort of the cartoon picture. And just to illustrate this dynamical instability in very simple terms, uh, here uh, I build two polytropic uh, neutron stars. So since the equation of state is uncertain, here we take uh, the simplest possible equation of state, which is a polytropic 
equation of state. What does that mean? Well, it means that when gamma is very, very large, that means that small changes in density lead to very high uh, pressures. And when gamma is high, we call those incompressible equations of state. Why? Because basically, any small change in density will lead to large pressure uh, changes. And as a result, uh, as you can see here, uh, where I plot the central density of the object to you know, its surface, you can see that in a gamma 3 incompressible equation of state, the density of the object is almost constant density. And then it slowly decreases. Yeah. Well, for example, if you have a very compressible equation of state, that means that you can pile up mass deeper in. And as a result, stars with, say, a 5 third equation of state are significantly centrally concentrated. Yeah. What I show here is the total angular momentum. And what you see here is the tidal effects, uh, which basically increase the steepness of the interaction potential as you bring these two objects. If they were point masses, you basically just have that line. But of course, since they're not, tidal effects give you this minimum. What happens? Well, if you have an extremely incompressible equation of state, these objects start feeling tidal effects at larger separations. If you have a very compressible equation of state, you have to get the objects significantly closer for them to become dynamically unstable. And in fact, with a gamma equal 3 equation of state, the dynamical stability is actually Newtonian. General relativistic corrections don't make a big <laughs> difference. If you have a very compressible equation of state, you need to add GR to this diagram, yeah, which has, was pointed also by Chandrasekhar. So as a result, something that it uh, basically follows, if you take you know, a hard to solve equation of state and you look at the spectrum of gravitational waves, you see that when you have a very soft very compressible equation of state, you get objects before they emerge to emit basically gravitational waves at a much higher frequency. Yeah. And that's why gravitational waves uh, give you a hint on the equation of state of these objects. OK, so I'm going to show you an old simulation. Uh, here we use the Sheng equation of state. I'll explain what that is. Uh, but these are the profiles that we get. This is density as a function of radius. This is, again, electron fraction. As you can see, the material is extremely neutron rich. I don't know if you can actually see these, but this is the effective gamma as a function of radius. Yeah? And as you can see, the effective gamma of this particular equation of state is close to gamma equal 3 and then drastically decreases. And as a result, these objects are going to become basically dynamically unstable at large distances. So we do this in SPH uh, with a realistic equation of state for hot, dense nuclear matter. Uh, there's significant issues with the simulation. Uh, but since this was the first one I did, uh, it just basically illustrates the point. As, two, as the objects become dynamic and stable, you get mass shredding in the outer Lagrangian points. And a very small fraction of the mass in these tidal tails is actually able to make it above the scale velocity. And this is where. Uh, we think that the majority of the R process is actually made. Yeah. Now, of course, the structure of the tidal tails, the amount of mass that it's able to get above the scale velocity uh, depends both on the framework that you use, you know, full general relativistic calculations. It depends on the equation of state. It uh, depends on the spin of the black hole, if you have a black hole neutron star and so forth. Uh, but in general, in the past 10 years, as you know well, uh, in this audience, this field has really exploded. Now people are doing general relativistic calculations with basically realistic equation of states and neutrino transport. And the overall agreement is that the unbound mass goes anywhere between 5 times 10 to the minus 3 to 5 times 10 to the minus 2. And the unbound velocities are anywhere between 0.1 and 0.3 c. And this is just directly related to basically what this k velocity is in the outer Lagrangian point, which depends on the equation of state. OK, so here I'm going to show you one of these trajectories from one of our calculations. As you were pointed out, in the R process network, we have neutron capture, photo dissociations, alpha and beta decay, and fission reactions. The first thing that I want to point out is that at t equals 0, in nuclear statistical equilibrium, you already have, as we were arguing, the seed nuclei required to do the capture. As you can see, you have time, temperature, 
and density, here is basically where nuclear heating of the radioactive elements actually started to play a role. You're able to get all the way to the third peak, decay, and beta decay, and produce the abundance that you see. Okay? So let me give you just a order of magnitude uh, argument and, and some intuition about how much our process material we make. For that, I'm going to use gold. Gold is about 6% in, in terms of the total mass of the R process. So one of these events uh, produces about a Jupiter mass of gold that is basically ejected above the scale velocity. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, SPH with a general relativistic framework where the particles we have painted such that uh, this is the regions in which the R process is made. So a significant fraction, in fact, of the R process will fall back into the newly formed black hole, but only a small fraction of that will be able to get it to the escape velocity. Uh, so for $50 per gram, you can calculate how much <laughs> you know, one Jupiter of gold uh, cost. Uh, if this is not impressive enough, this is also the amount of gold stored in about 6 million stars. Okay? So one of these uh, uh, events basically produces a significant fraction of the gold or R process content of the stars uh, here in the Milky Way. And therefore, you know, you know that the majority of the gold on Earth has probably just come from one of these events. Okay, so in the end of my talk, I wanted to contrast these two mechanisms. And, the w you know, the simple analogy that I made, which is a little bit silly, but sticks to your mind, is that type 2 are like a chocolate cookie with a very thin layer of chocolate. Yeah, that it's basically the chocolate is really well sparse, while neutral star mergers are like a chocolate chip cookie, in which basically all the chocolate is concentrated in basically small regions of space. And the key is basically how that our process is able to disperse. And immediately, you know, that tells you that there has to be some evidence in the element distribution in stars that basically can tell the difference between something that comes, you know, that occurs very frequently with something that actually is much more seldom but produces more mass. So I'm going to talk about clues from chemical evolution. Uh, the first one, which actually was puzzling for a lot of people, um, these are two surveys. Uh, and as you can clearly see, this is the halo, and this is close to the disk. Uh, this is metallicity in the standard unit. This is the europium content to iron, the magnesium to iron. And the first thing that is just striking here is that the magnesium RMS fluctuations is, signi is significantly smaller than the europium. As we know, magnesium comes from type 2. Europium, if it comes from type 2, how is it possible that you know, we have significant amount of you know, dispersion here compared to here. <coughs> hmm? Below iron. Well, it's an alpha, uh, you know, alpha. And, and if you do any alpha element, you basically get the same dispersion. So, you know, magnesium is just representative in this case, but it's basically an alpha element product, and it has, you know, it's, it primarily comes from type 2. Oh, because this is mainly comes from type two. Right. If you well, if you look at standard yields, the you know the majority of the magnesium comes from type two, um, drastically, you know, compared to other things. I mean, even if you have incomplete burning, uh, in okay. in helium so burning, you don't get. Well, so the argument is, yes, for example, say, you know, some people argue, well, this, you know, the, the europium comes from some jet, and, you know, the magnesium is really well distributed. You know, as you know, supernova remnants after about, you know, 10 mega years, you know, the mixing within them is very, very efficient. And the key is basically how these elements mix not on scales, you know, of 10 to the 15, 10 to the 18, but on scales of hundreds of parsecs. Uh -huh. How much mass is he working with? 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 7. Here, here you're looking also at the abundance ratio. So you have to be 
cognizant of this. So for example, uh, a way out for the type 2 is to say, well, not all type 2 supernova produce europium, and only 1% of them produce europium. And that's basically a viable alternative to get away from this. But of course, what you need is that the, you, know, you have to increase the mass per event in that 1% of the events. No? So Nomoto argues, for example, that if you have a very crazy type 2 with a jet, and then you can actually get significant amount of R process based on those conditions, you just basically have to, I think what this tells you is uh, that you have to basically have a type 2 process that is rarer and produces more mass per event. That's all. And I'll show you this in a cosmological setting. Uh, so just, I wanted to also make the point that only a few percent of metal poor and all stars show clear R process signatures. Uh, and here I'm just going to show two of my favorite stars in which you can clearly see they're about the same metallicity as measured by iron, but they basically have drastic difference of R process content. Yeah? So something like that has like a Pluto mass of gold, and something like that has like a small asteroid mass of gold. Yeah? So very drastic uh, R process content, even though the average metallicity is the same. And you can see this clearly in the spectrum, where you look at the europium, you can see the difference in the depth of the line. Uh, this object, particularly the Chris uh, Sneedon star, has also tons of carbon. And that won't be the topic of my talk, but we can talk about it on the questions. There's these carbon-enriched metal-poor stars, and some of them are also extremely europium-rich. There's also europium-rich stars that don't have carbon. Okay? But this is just to illustrate that you can find two objects with similar iron content, but very drastic difference. So in order to test this idea, uh, we work with Javier Aguedas, which you all know. She made this beautiful simulation of the area simulation, which uh, basically is basically tailored to mimic the properties of the Milky Way today. You get the right total number of stars. Uh, the you know, dark matter content is about what you expect. And just for your view and pleasure, Javier did this wonderful simulation, which you may have seen. But, uh, so what we have done is we have taken this simulation of the assembly history of the Milky Way, and we basically have injected neutron star mergers, and this simulation has type 2 feedback. So we can basically test in a cosmological framework this idea of, well, do we really you know, need very sparse with very uh, significant amount of mass injection versus you know, type 2s that are you know, much more common but with little mass? And of course, as you know, the simulation uh, is chosen as most others that try to make the Milky Way uh, for merger trees that have a very quiet history. In this simulation, the gas is basically uh, the gray, the pink is the stellar light, and the dark matter is not shown. Uh, and of course, we're zooming in at this, you know, the scales of the disk. So in this simulation, we have semi-self-consistently, at least the star formation history of, uh, of the Milky Way. And I'll, I'll show you in a second basically how we construct the mergers to compare them. So how many mergers will there be? I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you in a second. So we have some freedom because you can choose the mass per event and then you basically can choose the rate. So uh, basically what we did in this simulation is we basically make sure that the total amount of R process at the end of the simulation by the two processes is the same. And that basically requires some choices. And I'll, I'll illustrate what choices we made. Okay, so this is the star formation history of the Milky Way, which directly gives you the core collapse supernova rate. This is, notice the scale, this is per century. And this is the neutron star merger rate, which is per mega year. And in order to construct this, we assume that no merger can actually happen before 100 mega years. And we assume the probability distribution of 1 over time. Yeah? This is empirically derived. If you actually look at log A of the separations of neutron star binaries, it's actually flat. <laughs> and that implies that the merger is going to go as 1 over time. And with that, this is the structure that you get. Yeah? So once having this uh, neutron star merger rate, you basically have to make some choices in terms of the masses 
and the choices that we made was you know that each of these mergers give you about five times ten to the minus two uh, masses of our process, and these basically yields a mass of our process about seven point four ten to the minus five in type two, which is in the high side. Uh, Franz will probably argue that this is also on the on the sort of optimistic side of neutron star mergers. So of course, if I reduce the amount of mass per event, then I have to increase the rate. And just to give you an idea, these, you know, mega you know, one per mega year is sort of the average advanced LIGO rate. The optimistic is 50. Yeah, so you're in between. So this is uh, shown the gas. Uh, this is uh, show assume inversion of where, you know, this is large scale, small scale. This simulation assumes that type 1a traces the stellar mass. So type 1a are basically injected following the stellar mass distribution, uses stellar mass distribution as a probability distribution. We do the same for mergers. We assume that both mergers and type 1a traces uh, the stellar mass. There's no type 1a feedback in this simulation. That means that type 1a are basically uh, just injecting mass but no energy. The same we do with the mergers. A merger, just to give you a feeling, injects about the same amount of kinetic energy to the medium. Even though the mass is small, the velocities are high. And it is assumed that, not assumed, but you know, type 2 traces the star formation. And of course, that depends on your star formation prescription. So what do you find? Well, the first thing that you notice, that we notice in the simulation, was we said, well, anything we do, we basically have to explain the alpha to iron rate, just based on type 2s. So here is the alpha to iron rate as a function of time. And the first thing that we notice is if you don't have a mixing prescription, there's regions of parameter space in which basically these systems are enriched by type 1a, but they're not enriched by core collapse supernovae, yeah? which is basically not what you see. So what do we do? Well, we come up with a mixing prescription, which just depends with an average diffusion rate for turbulent mixing. Uh, to basically match the alpha to iron rate. And of course, you immediately know that since we're basically matching the dispersion in the alpha to iron, type 2 are going to fail in giving us the dispersion of europium to iron because we're assuming that they're both are producing both alpha and our process at the same, in the same size. So, No, so in the yeah, so in the mixing you inject, you know, all of these are injected in this blast wave sort of model, you know, at the scale of the resolution time scale. And in in the no mixing, they basically assume that those individual particles, you know, they have a kernel, and once the kernel ends, there's basically no further mixing. In the new mixing prediction prescription, we just assume a diffusion coefficient that it's constant. Um, something more sophisticated could it be that it depends on the shearing. Uh, profile, for example, of rotation or something like that. Here we just assume that it's basically isotropic and you know, in all directions and then there's, you know, that allows mixing to take place. And we basically, uh, but something that I do want to highlight is that the, and you know, this is basically the, not surprising, type 2 failed to give you the large RMS fluctuation that you see, but merges actually with the same diffusion coefficient actually give you the right, uh, you know, large scale of RMS fluctuations in the European content. Now, I'm not claiming that we just found the specific diffusion coefficient, but I'm just saying that in fact, the RMS fluctuation here holds information about how metal diffusion took place in the early universe. And I think that's quite important. Yeah, so. Uh, I, we, we, in the, so Sh Shen has a paper in which she looks at the, at the abundance of the gas, but we haven't looked into detail of the abundance of the stars. And in fact, we're, you know, I was just now looking at the distributions of the abundance of europium rich stars in the halo and whether or not they were fairly isotropic or it had any sort of uh, substructure that you can see. You know? So yeah, we're looking at that in detail. Oh, just because europium is the easiest to see in stars, and that's where we have most of the, you know, it has the, the largest oscillation strength, so that gives you the deep absorption feature. Do you assume uh, diffusion across the magnetic field? 
we assume, uh, you know, fairly, you know, isotropic diffusion, and we basically have no magnetic fields. I agree. Yeah. Uh, 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 we can talk offline of that, but the you know M15 has huge issues. Now, for example, in M15 you can find stars that have the same alpha to iron ratio, but you have stars that differ in European by a factor of 10, say, within the globular, within the globular cluster. So the argument is, if you believe that that you can have a molecular cloud that has European gradients with scales of a parsec such that mixing did not mix homogeneously on those scales, which makes me uncomfortable. Or alternatively, that that European was acquired. No? So if you had maybe a neutron star merger in the early phases, uh, in the, you know, where there was a significant amount of gas, sort of what you predict with Charlie uh, to make the second uh, generation of stars, uh, because you basically have to stop the blast wave, the amount of europium that you have to accrete into the evolved stars, because they're all fully convective, so you have to mix it across the entire star, is about 10 to the minus 7 solar masses. So it's, maybe it's not so crazy. With a, a, you know, with a mass ejection of 10 to the minus 2, that you're able to accrete 10 to the minus uh, 5 okay, solar masses. Not in globular clusters, no, because in globular clusters you can actually form them dynamically. And because you can form them dynamically, you can form them much faster. No? So the, the most effective way to do it is basically single binary interactions. And this is work that Johann Samson has done. Uh, so that's, you know, and the rate is comparable to that of the field. So you don't have to wait. OK, so I'm almost out of time. But I want to make just my last point, which is for a long time people use these closed box chemical evolution models to argue that that 100 mega year delay time was basically the kiss of death for neutron star mergers. So what I show here is the most up to date Matteucci model of a closed box model with exact same assumptions that we made. And what I show here is basically the average abundance of the coal gas. Yeah, if you take the entirety of the coal gas you basically take all the elements and you basically measure an average abundance in the box, this is what you get. So basically, it's, it's not surprising. The total amount of element production in the box, it's very, very similar. But in fact, when you actually look at this, you know, the abundance of the stellar content, you clearly see that they don't follow the average uh, uh, Abundance and you know thinking about the average abundance in the first giga year of the evolution of the Milky Way makes no sense because of course even just the sound crossing time across the Milky Way is about a giga year so any turbulent mixing process that you can think is going to operate inefficiently and this is exactly what we see yeah what is interesting is that the lowest metallicity star that we paint is about minus three the lowest metallicity star that has ever been detected with europium content is about minus three point two. So the standard argument that neutron star mergers are just too delayed to actually enrich uh, stars of low metallicity is incorrect. And it just derives from this idea that you know, this closed box model idea in which basically everything is mixed instantaneously is correct. Yeah? And this has been for many, many years, decades, the main argument against these mergers. Uh, so you know, the conclusion here is that mergers are consistent with our process enrichment at low C. I'm not, uh, and you know, we have tried, for example, making the rate smaller by a factor of 10, making the mass injection by a factor of 10, and in C. Jinx's paper, we do a lot of combinations, and we show that this large RMS fluctuation is, in fact, really robust to, you know, changes on, on those properties. Of course, you can always claim that the type 2 process that you require has to be basically in a small subset of those. But the only thing that you need to compensate by that is the mass per event has to significantly increase. So I'll stop here. And you know, this is my summary. Uh, I hope I can convince you that from a nuclear physics perspective, these objects are the perfect uh, R process nucleosynthesis sites. Uh, the relative robust nuclear pathways here, I want it to be uh, slightly uh, more honest and show you that there's still uh, significant uh, changes in the abundance patterns that many groups find depending on the specific nuclear physics, but the changes are small. And in fact, the biggest problem 
of the type two is actually to give you the second and third peak, while we now have six independent groups, different six, you know, using different you know physics, getting to you know the same sort of robustness of this. And interestingly, I think that you know we can now start testing. Uh, these chemical evolution models that are slightly more sophisticated and learn things like you know turbulent diffusion in the early universe, uh, which I think you know holds a lot of promise. And I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>